nine to six o'clock every night. Sure. It's open for a few hours every day, you know. Yeah. Well, it leaves, it leaves its Wi-Fi connection on Right. right. That's the kids should be able to do it at home. Yeah. Sit on the sidewalk. Yeah, that's... It's starting out behind. Not being able to access the internet if you're a kid exactly. trying to do your homework. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty serious. Yeah. And also, I have to say that we, in my house, we have both uh, cell phones through the computer for when there's no electricity. Like but we have a regular landline for emergency only. So it's another cost, a monthly cost that's being incurred. And it's expensive. And they're ratcheting up those prices now. Yeah. So we don't it's use it, but just for those emergency moments. And uh, yeah. it's expensive. Yes, it is. So clearly, this is something we got to continue to work. So I, I hear that. And I, um, the more we can kind of cap, and we will help to do the work in capturing the, the stories, if you are willing to take a few minutes in a follow up. Sure. Um, Absolutely. And, and also, there's another huge issue. Every restaurant you go into, even the stores say, help one in all positions. Yeah. There is no place for people to live. And we have an Airbnb problem, major problem, in this area. And so they might be renting their house out for a couple months of the year, and the rest of the time it's closed down, or maybe it's just weekends. And so people who want to work here can't live here. Right. So what are we going to do? This is, at least so far, the single biggest issue I've heard, not Airbnb specifically, although that's, I think, a significant contributing piece of it, but okay. housing affordability um, across the county, whether it's a more you know, urban area in Kingston, where rents have almost doubled in the last 10 years. It's $1,400 to rent a one-bedroom apartment in Midtown Kingston, right now, which wow. is crazy. I never would have imagined that. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the, the rental inventory is 0.1%. Um, we have 14 of 24 towns that are below 3% inventory. Under 5% is considered emergency um, by, by the state, you know, by most kind of economists. Um, so figuring out how to get more uh, housing inventory is something we're, we have our planning department looking at right now. Um, to be honest, one of the challenges we face is everybody says we need more housing, but nobody wants uh, housing often built in their in their area. Um, so one of the things that you know we need to come together as a community and, and say, okay, we know we have the shortage. Where are reasonable, logical places that we can build uh, both, mostly apartments? It's, that's rentals seem to be the most of the gap. It depends town to town. But how can we do that in a responsible way um, that serves everybody, you know, kind of not just necessarily subsidized affordable housing, but actual people who are working and can't afford to pay their rent, which is in 2019 in America, I think, unacceptable. Um, so that's something that we're looking at, but that we'll want everybody's help and discussion into. Um, frankly, it's a little frustrating to me when everybody says we need housing, but then somebody comes in and wants to build it who's generally doing things right and you get some pushback. So that's, that's an area I'll you know, ask everybody's help in. I don't know any specific projects here right now, although I may, there may be some I'm not aware of, but definitely around the county, that's something we're facing. Um, but aren't we restricted here because of the water shade right. and the Right, that's that. exactly. And that's, one, again, one of the unique compounding challenges that, that you all face. Um, <laughs> Right. Um, and you have a lot of senior citizens that can't afford to keep up sets of food in the lab. Um, one of the things that we are looking at there is trying to take, so just as an example, the town of Rosendale has really cracked the code on how to go out and get grant money for, for sewer and water infrastructure funds. So one of the things we're looking at is, can we ask them to share some of their best practices there? That's not a one-year turn. That's a you know, that's a five to seven-year plan. But yeah, when we start to look at getting scale both on commercial and residential, those are investments we have to to make, and that's something that you know we've looked at as a county level. Um, could we help? I think the area we might be able to help is around the financing and the securing enough you know, capital funds. Um, to help the town go out and take out loans or bond to make those investments. Often those investments, the dollars are just too high to be able to make work in the town budget. 
but we're looking at it, this is super wonky, but a provision that would allow us to open up our kind of lending and um, creditability um, as part of, you know, if it's tied to economic um, development growth, you know, foundational investments in infrastructure and things like that. So we're just starting to see if that's even possible. Um, but that's something I think you could look at. But uh, you're, you're, you're totally right. And I do want to ask, I know it's maybe a hot button question, but um, I would love to hear more about your all's perspective on short-term rentals and the impacts. This is something that we're facing, you know, every time I go, I'm hearing kind of um, at, least, at least a recognition that every town is working through some degree of a policy. Um, and we're trying to understand at the county level are things we could do to help or to, you know, to um, facilitate that. So um, I may be opening up a can of worms. Actually, I do, I do have something to say about that, but I had another question too regarding the cell service. Yep. Isn't that something that Antonio Delgado is working on too? Yep. Maybe joining forces with him exactly. and just getting a bunch of buses and we load up the buses and camp out in front of Cuomo's house. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that part I'll give you the credit for. <laughs> but no, I, no I, so I actually, I, I, uh, I really like and respect the kind of thing I saw him this morning. Yeah. Um, and we, we've talked about both broadband internet and workforce development skills training as the two areas where we think, even in the pretty you know gridlocked situation we have, those are areas where there's real opportunity to get federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, on workforce development, the state just issued $150 million in grants that we're starting to write to now at the county level for skills training. Um, and Delgado is definitely fighting on broadband stuff mm -hmm. to try to get more funding. So we will absolutely, you know, we're well positioned as a county to get some love if and when that um, mm -hmm. starts. And starts what about the high fair grants? We have a wonderful um, group of people here called Flying Cats. And it brings it. the Woodland Valley was where Woodstock really started in in the 1939. I don't know if you knew that. For 22 years, we had festivals on Simpsons Mountain, and 800 to 1,000 people attended. 300 to 400 of them were the campers and the counselors, mm. and Joan Baez, and I mean everybody, Pete Seeger, the whole world. Then it took off. You know, Woodstock, of course, is the art community, but we. We need cultural grants. Yep. We need. We have flying cats. We. There are a group of people who bring in some of the top talent from New York, going to Boston. Mm. They come and play here. Folk, folk music. Folk music mm. folk. at at the. Um, it's now at the Methodist Church. It used to be at the railroad station. Mm -hmm. And we we need cultural grants for that. Yeah. Is that the, yeah. Yep. That's, that's it. That's the card you just gave. Yeah. That was a good plug. You got it. Okay. I hear that. Because people come from all over for it. Because sure, yeah, yeah. Well, and there are other things. It's about Trevor Arts, it's the Festival of Voice, it's a, but it's one of the the art, the Shindig art tour. I mean, a lot of our absolutely, creativity. the arts yep. is again. What, if you go back to our kind of competitive yep. advantages, that's yep. absolutely one of them. We're starting to see, and a big credit to my predecessor, the film industry really starting so, to. Yeah. Gain some real momentum here after some investment. And also, film credit. stars are moving to Phoenicia. Yeah. Who doesn't want provides, provides jobs, too. We really need jobs. Absolutely. That's, 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 if I could go back to the second part yeah. of the question. Sure. Um, so, so, speaking and tying back into short term rentals, um, yeah, we're getting more <coughs> movies and films and things that are being done here. But also, a lot of those people are coming up and staying at the short term rentals. Right. So. Like my question to you is, have you formulated a firm opinion on whether or not you think that short-term rentals should be treated as a business and should be legislated, taxed, and regulated as such? Um, I mean, the short answer is not yet. <laughs> um, that's kind of why I wanted to hear everybody's input. Um, my sense is that, uh, one, it, it is pretty widely different, town to town. Um, and so I do think I want to be careful to have like a that there's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all county-level or state-level solution. Um, that's, I think, probably, a, there may be some overarching principles, but um, different towns, I think, are going to have a different sense. Um, but I think there's a big difference between, you know, someone who's maybe a few
few weekends a month or something or renting a guest house to generate a little extra income versus folks that are buying multiple properties, often through LLCs. And at that point, what I would consider pretty common sense running you know, businesses or some sort of for-profit enterprise. So I think finding the right line there is, is the key. Um, I've, really, I've been closely watching how Woodstock's navigating it. They're kind of first to put out some actual legislation after lots and lots and lots of yeah. heated discussion. I don't think it's not necessarily perfect for or right for here, but it, it seemed to be right for them where they had over 50% of their rental inventory short, as short term rental. <coughs> they were basically at a crisis situation where people who had lived there for decades were having to leave because they just couldn't afford it. So they set a cap on basically no new uh, properties. They set a bunch of regulations around kind of. Uh, how long, you know, how many days of the year the property can be rented and how many you could own. So that's a, at least a piece of legislation that people can look at. But to answer your question directly, not yet, but I'm hoping to hear from folks and, and, and hear that. So Yeah, because there's, as you know, there's a very large concentration in Here. this area. Yeah. And so. Here in Woodstock. And it's and growing. Yeah. It's growing at a really, like, alarming rate. And that all ties back into, too, like the lack of the long-term housing. And it's right. just, it's a very tentacled. And the subject. second and third order effects of then you don't have folks who can volunteer in the volunteer fire department and mm -hmm. send yeah. their kids to school. And, you know, so okay. there's pros and cons, but we have to look at all the kind of the ripple effect and make sure that it's being <coughs> thought through as well. I know, Mandy, you had some feedback. Hi, yeah, I'm Maria Giannis. Oh. So I'm very familiar with the Woodstock situation because um, uh, I understand both sides, but I feel like the housing shortage is separate from the short-term rentals, and, not, and I'll tell you why. Um, the taxes and the tax rate and also the, the uh, home purchase prices wouldn't allow for someone to be able to pay their mortgage and their taxes and rent it at a, a rate that would be affordable for somebody local looking for housing. So I really feel like those are separate issues. That's my first point. And the second point is I feel that Woodstock did some overreaching in terms of um, what homeowners, how homeowners can use their own property. Um, in my experience, um, um, I sell real estate and from the real estate family, and um, most of my buyers who are first time home buyers who are artists who are maybe coming up from Brooklyn and maybe also local, yeah. but they can't afford anywhere else, so they buy a home here and they rent it out part of the time to be able to afford it. Right. And they're not an LLC and they're not buying up a bunch of properties, but they're being pigeonholed into this. Um, bad guy situation, they take care of the garbage, they're like employing local people, I mean they have caretakers and they have construction people coming all the time and they, you know, there's an influx and I think one of the reasons our area is growing is because we do have um, people coming to the area to spend money. So I think we need to look at all sides and, yep. and, and I appreciate you saying you're not sure yet and you would like our input. Yeah, so no, thanks for that. Sure. And you have the same thing. What's up? Okay. No, I just wanted to say, uh, Wilson noted that Brian Beck also passed laws yes. restricting the number of They were very, trees. very and I restricted. think that there's something to be said for that for those that are not owner occupied, people who are buying up properties mm -hmm. up here, yep. and it's happening here, which takes it off the market so people can't afford to buy it. That's why the prices are up, yep. because we got that. So I would be in favor of And, and I do want to be just clear before you, sorry, before you weigh in now. Um, this is, I very much respect the, the principle of home rule, and that uh, by no means would the county look to encroach on what you all do as a, as a town, but um, we do have some degree of kind of input in this, particularly on how we collect the taxes and stuff, so um, sorry, you were gonna. Oh, uh, yeah, the short-term rentals, we've been affected personally, uh, being able to find a rental in the meantime, we moved back from here, a little bit back to Rock Air, then we moved out to Central New York, bought and sold a home there, came back 
Thank you for coming back. Yeah, of course. <laughs> we love to love, um, love care. Um, but unfortunately, we have been pushed out of Ulster County and the town of Shenandoah uh, because we aren't able to find a home to purchase within a budget. Yep. That's you know, two people that are working full time that mm -hmm. maybe don't make, make enough, but not, not apparently not enough <laughs> yeah. to support right. homes that are in that price range. And, um, and the short term rentals are affecting that because of the homes that we tried to negotiate on, the homeowners wouldn't because they didn't see a need, a need to sell if they were being able to still pay for it. Yep. Having to Airbnb it and rent it out that way. Um, so we were pushed out. So where are you living? We're now going to be moving to Tanner's Hill in Green Hill. Oh. <laughs> being pushed out. But we are couldn't find a longer term rental in order, you know, to find our house here. Uh, so we were renting a short term rental because there were no other long term rentals in this area. That kind of sums up everything yeah. right there. And, um, <laughs> I, yeah. I, was, I was gonna say, it's just like a major problem for uh, economic development. Right. I mean, obviously this place is no Silicon Valley or anything like that, but um, you know, the main industry around here is tourism. Um, I work in the engineering field and everything. You know, even being an engineer, it's hard for us to even pay for, you know, renting or Someone else hit on this, I forget who it was, in terms of companies saying we can't, yeah, we can't hire folks. Can't and then you layer on the child care piece, I don't know if you guys are in that boat yet, but um, that that's another thing here is a huge obstacle, is people choosing to not work, because basically it's not worth the younger you know, folks with kids, it's not worth the cost uh, by the time you do child care and the lost time and everything. So um, it's all layered, and so, uh, yeah, I, that's that's a story I wish was not the case. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I, um, that's that's a bummer. Um, we'll see what we can do here. <laughs> well, I have a concern. My neighbor who owns a house, they're weekend people, and a little bit both the house. All right. <laughs> both the house next to them turn it into Airbnb, and both the house next to it now and they're going to turn it again. So, like, the whole company becomes Airbnb, and it's lovely homes that were built around here, but out of reach of people. So, maybe it's the town that needs to make restriction of what people do with their houses, or if it's to long term, short term sales, maybe, or is it county? It's the town level that would decide if the town decides to do that. So. Yeah. And One more question. How many uh, people do we have in the, in the uh, county? About 180,000 people. Of Ulster <laughs> County? Of Ulster County. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and we are, we are starting, for a while we were declining in terms of population, but we're just starting to see more people coming back. Hopefully uh, we can not, you know, we can try to keep driving that. Sir, I think we have time for one or two more. Okay, I was going to ask, are county funds funding the development of long-term rental facilities anywhere else in the county? Yes. Right. Yeah, so um, there, are, there are multiple projects. Um, we're actually just, we're starting to, I just had a conversation with the mayor of Kingston about whether we could do uh, one, a joint, a joint effort in the city, uh, just given how acute the rental is there. Um, City of Kingston has several. Um, I don't actually, I don't know that there are any ongoing county funded um, right now. Most of the development happening is either state or federal funded, um, federally funded, and it's uh, mostly happening in and around Kingston right now. Um, we gotta figure out how to crack the code to do a, do a different model in other parts, in other parts of the county. So the Kingstonian project, James Proposter, Kingston, um, they're in a zone that was rezoned specifically for 
affordable housing is being incorporated in the construction, and this project is going to be massive, yep. including a large hotel, many market rate apartments, right. no provision for affordable housing, and yet nobody seems to be making that an issue and, and causing them to consider that. Do you, do you have any yeah. insight into that, how that could happen? Yeah, the question was about the Kingstonian project. Um, I, I have raised concerns about the lack of affordable housing in that project specifically for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, I just think given the shortage we have, like we talked about the numbers before, we really shouldn't be doing any project, specifically in that case, a project funded with significant taxpayer dollars. Um, so I've raised that concern, taken a few beatings from folks uh, who say that that will you know, hurt uh, economic activity in our time case, and I'm not sure I agree with that. Um, so yeah, that again, that's ultimately a city uh, planning board decision. It's as you probably know in front of the planning board right now. Um, but I have I have talked about that, and I still have that concern. So yeah, and I think we should have that discussion with every um, everything any development we do, especially if we're putting tax dollars behind and we know the housing shortage. Um, I, I don't think it makes sense that we would not have some degree of set aside for folks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Man, these are good, these are good, good questions. Thank you all. <clears throat> Any, um, sir? So I'm looking forward to the Ashokan Rail Trail opening, and I was wondering if there are plans to extend the trail up through Shandaken to, towards High Mount or <clears throat> Um Not currently. Um, not currently, but I you know that's something we could look at eventually. The uh, <clears throat> The immediate is that uh, 12 mile stretch. Um, as you probably well know, driving by, works mostly done on the trail portion, and now they're working on the trail. We're working on the trailheads. Um, we think we may be able to get the, at least two of the three trailheads open by um, mid October ish timeframe. That's that's the tentative, um, the tentative goal. Uh, and I know there's been lots of discussion about this. Um, <laughs> lots of feelings about this. Um, so far from what I've seen, we've already seen several businesses along the corridor either stay there when they were going to leave, and a few of them actually um, move to bigger bigger um, expand. space, expand on the on the sort of excitement and optimism about folks coming up. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think done right, it'll, it'll, it'll be a driver of economic growth. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something we'll, we'll be, it's the first time our county's actually run, uh, and, and legislator Nolan knows a lot more about this than I do, um, but it's the first time we'll actually run a, a, a trail network at the county level. Um, so we're gonna be really focused on making sure we do it right, that we have safety in mind as we do it, um, both for, for people using the trail, but also access up into and around the trail to minimize the impacts on everybody here. So um, we'll, we'll be working and focus closely on that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Kathy. You've been, you've been working on that for a while. I just, uh, we're really excited and I'm looking forward to getting it open. And I do think the county is going to do a great job of maintaining it and working with uh, trail stewards to have it be really safe, beautiful. Uh, it's, it's designed to be handicapped accessible. And so I think it's going to be a, a real treasure for us out here. I, I will say, I'll close on this note. I don't know if I'm supposed to say this or not, but I snuck, I snuck out there a few weeks ago. Um, <laughs> and I went on the, to the Glenford Dyke section. It is just epic. I mean, it is incredible. Um, I really think this will be a draw, a, a regional, if not national draw. It, it really is just breathtaking. And given our proximity, to, to the biggest market concentration of people in the country already in the city, 70 something miles away. Um, I think if we do this right and we all kind of come together around it, it's a huge, huge opportunity to just draw people in and to build some real momentum. So Pat, kudos to lots of folks who, who work on this for, for a long time. I was fortunate enough to get a, a sneak peek tour as well. It is, I could not believe it. Yeah. It is amazing. It's pretty cool. Cool. We were so we are so excited about this opening up. It's just it was beyond anything that I could 
picture what it would be like. Yeah. Is this the pedal cars? Uh, no, this, this is just a, oh, a, a recreational a trail. trail. Um, it's about, I think it's 15 feet wide, right? Or is it 12? 16? No, it's 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 fully accessible to you know, any, anyone. It's wide enough that you actually can drive a vehicle on it if needed, and all the bridges are rated for emergency vehicles as well. Um, the total, I think. So a little over 11 miles. Yeah, yeah. Um, what is the surface? It's uh, it's like a crushed fine. There are multiple layers, but the top layer is, is um, it's not paved, but it's it's pretty pretty smooth. It's, it's in the town of Olives, right? It's in Olive and Hurley yeah. and Chan it and Chandagin. Uh, no, it stops at Boyceville. Boyceville right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where's the trailhead? There are three trailheads. Um, one is um, kind of like up by wood, or by uh, Basin Road. Um, the second is right when you hit the right when you hit the Shandaken line there, right? Or the um, yeah, no, no, the, uh, the line. Yeah. And then the third one is it's going to be at Boyceville. Yeah. So it's um, Olive, Hurley, and Woodstock has a little piece of it as well yeah. uh, in this section that's being developed. And the important thing to know for now is the construction is still going on, and so it's closed to all access yeah, until the formal opening. We're, we're charged to say that if yeah. we mention this trail at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, we hope to have that open in October. I, I know there are probably more questions or comments. If there are, um, I can hang around a bit. Um, also, you know, if you happen to be around Kingston, our office is uptown. I'm going to continue to try to make as many, you know, the rounds as I can. Um, our website um, is up. We're on Facebook and Twitter. I'm trying to 